Well, welcome to Mapping the Way to Sustainable Energy, a Digital Transformation. My name is Bill Meehan. I'm the Director of Electric Utility Solutions at Esri, and I am thrilled to be able to present this uh, presentation to you. So let's start with a pop quiz. What's the weakest finger in your hand? Well, I bet everybody started to grab for their pinky finger, and that's right. And what is the most popular letter of the alphabet? Well, it's A. So tell me this, why is it that the original designers of the keyboard chose to put that popular letter A in that awkward position to be struck by the baby finger? Why did they do that? Well, it doesn't make any sense. Well, I'll tell you. Well, the original design of the keyboard was mechanical. I mean, it was a typewriter. And remember, it had levers. And so as the people got good at typing, all the levers started to jam up. So they had to figure out, well, what do I do to make things better? So they decided to put the popular letters in hard to get to places so they could slow the typist down. Well, we've had electrical keyboards and electronic keyboards forever. And yet we still continue to use that legacy keyboard design. Why do we do that? Well, you know, maybe we just don't want to change, but I think it's, it's deeper than that. I think we've become so used to it that we can't even see that we need something new or something better. And in fact, there's a term for that kind of blindness and it's called a scotoma. Well, it's a medical term, it means tunnel vision, but it also means failure to see what's before our very eyes, a scotoma. And that's really kind of interesting because it really helps you, if you can get rid of that scotoma, it helps you to do things differently. And in fact, this is a, a, com a conversation about geospatial technology. And geospatial technology, NearMap and Esri, helps us to think differently, to look closer. And that's the theme of this conference, isn't it? Geospatial technology really has two components. One, it has content, you know, all of the stuff of the world. In an electrical world, it would be all the wires and the poles and, and the energy would be, you know, wind farms and solar stuff like that. That's the content, being able to capture that. But it also provides the context, the relationships, the way things relate to one another, the patterns and the behaviors. That's what geospatial technology allows us to do. And it allows us to create digital transformation. Oh, digital transformation. Everybody talks about digital transformation. And <laughs> I like that term, but I like to think about it as really more than just digitizing something. And I'll give you an example of true digital transformation in another industry. So do you remember this thing? Does anybody know what this thing is? That's a VHS tape. In fact, I don't even know, remember what VHS actually stands for. But anyway, it's a VHS tape, and it's an analog device, right? So then I would ask the question, what replaced the VHS tape? The DVD. And when I say that this was digital, this is analog. So when we replaced the VHS with a DVD, was that an example of digital transformation? And I would say that is a definite, resounding no. And the reason why it's a no is because, you know, it really didn't change our behavior. It really didn't make, we didn't do things differently. Remember when we had the VHS tapes? Well, we would put them on the shelf or we'd put them in the boxes and the boxes would go in our garage or in closets and so forth. When we went to the DVDs, what do we do? We put them on our shelves and we put them in boxes. And it never really changed the way we, we behaved about the, the movies. So, but then what replaced the DVD? Streaming video, Hulu, and Netflix, and, and Prime Video, and, and really changed the behavior. <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing. So if I want to watch a movie like the Lord of, Lord of the Rings that's in this, uh, this, this picture here, what I would do with Hulu or video, uh, or Netflix videos or something, I would just simply, you know, put it on. Whereas in the old days, I'd have to go look for the DVD. And you know, the funny thing is um, that even, th <laughs> this is really funny, even though I have a DVD of the movie I want to watch, I would rather pay 
you know, the three dollars to see the video than to have to go scurrying around and look for the DVD. And so that's really a case of true digital transformation. Now, I worked for the power company for several decades, and I was the champion of the GIS project, the Geographic Information System project. And so this picture here that I'm showing you is an old paper map that was produced in 1928 or something like that. And as you can see, it shows houses and streets. And if you look really closely, it actually shows electrical conductors and transformers and things like that. Well, when we wanted to convert this paper map, this analog map to digital, we used GIS. And so we did. We, we converted it over to this as an example. Same area. But the funny thing is that when we tried to introduce the digital map to the folks, they wanted to make sure that that digital map looked exactly like the old one. In fact, we used to teach, tease each other in the, on the project team that if we could figure out how to create a symbol for that little tear, you see that little tear over there, we'd create a symbol for the tear or maybe create a, a coffee stain symbol because people were so used to using these old maps, the digital maps, they wanted them to be the exact duplicate of the old paper maps. And not only that, we also discovered that people used the new digital maps in the same way that they used the old paper maps. And what would they do? Well, in the old days, they would take the paper maps or the, or the, 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 the transparency maps, make blueprints of them, and then they would hang them on the wall or they would take them on, put them on the floor and you know tape them together. Just like now that we created the new GIS maps, We'd print them out again, only this time they would be in color. And what would we do? We'd stick them up on the wall or lay them on the floor exactly the same way. We never really changed our behavior. So that's really an example of what I like to call digital transition. It's not the same. So here's an example, another example of really good digital transformation. So this is a map room. This is where all of the old paper maps were stored. You see them all rolled up over there in this paper everywhere. And what this company did, this was a water utility. They performed digital transformation. They took this room and they converted it to that. They get rid of all of the paper. They get rid of all of the old rolls and they used new technology in a completely different way. And I think of old paper. Sometimes, and I don't know if you ever go into a, an office and you see this thing here is called a work order folder. And it's got paper maps and all kinds of stuff in here. Now we could, we could take these folders and scan all these documents in, but you know, would that really be a case of digital transformation? Probably not, because we're going to be doing things the same old way. Scanned images and paper maps are kind of the same thing. So as I said, digital transformation really has these two components. A technology, well, certainly you need technology. I mean, the DVD was a new digital technology that really at least started the process of, of moving to digital transformation. But the, the most important thing is that it changes behavior and not just behavior for the sake of changing behavior, but behavior to make things a lot better. I mean, a lot better. You know, just, just doing, watching Netflix is just so much better than scurrying around finding a DVD or a paper map or, or a digital version of a paper map really doesn't change our behavior very much. We really need to change things, have to do things different ways. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of really good digital transformation. And the first one is kind of the obvious one that we always talk about, which is Uber. It's the world's largest taxi company. And yet we don't have any taxis. They don't have any taxis. And, and they really changed the, the way in which they thought about transportation in, in the public is that, that instead of having to flag down a taxi, the taxi comes to you or the car comes to you, the transportation comes to you. It just changed the equation. And they use geospatial technology as well to do it. The next one is Netflix, the world's largest movie house. Well, they don't own any cinemas. So again, they change the, 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 the kind of, the, they switch things around and so that the movie comes to you instead of you going to the movie house. Airbnb is the same thing, the largest accommodation provider, but they don't own any real estate. Again, they change the equation around so that, they, that, that you go to them instead of them going to you. It's a, it's a whole change of philosophy. And the world's most popular media owner is Facebook. And yet they don't own any content. Instead, you create the content. And, we've, and of course, social media has really changed behavior. So that's really a case of 
digital transformation. I, I, I coined the term, as I said earlier, digital transition. And that's really kind of a, you know, an incremental change going from it's like a paper map to an exact duplicate of a, of, a, of a paper map. Whereas geospatial technology, near map and ESRI, take content from all over the place, combining it, analyzing, using artificial intelligence to be able to see things that you could not see in just a replication of a paper map. That's true digital transformation. So why peel away these scotomas? Why want to change things? Why do we need to look closer? Why? Well, in the case of energy transition, we're going to need a whole lot of of renewable energy. If we're going to be decarbonizing by 2050, if we're going to be sustainable by 2050, we're going to have to do things completely different. We can't just, just muddle along and change things in a transition way. Look at in 2020, look at look at the amount of, this is a, this is a map from the from the uh, Department of Energy and look at what solar shows. It's it's like, in a, in a, you know, it's less than 100 gigawatts to 1,570 gigawatts of solar. I mean, that's not something that we can do easily. We need to think differently about this. And, and look at what the storage, we have no clean storage today. We're going to need six, over 1,600 uh, um, gigawatts of storage in order to get to this decarbonization of the energy system by 2050. And we're going to have to think about things in a different way. How do we how do we produce these wind and 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 solar farms? Where are we going to put the? What about trans transmission, electric transmission? There's some estimates to say that we're going to need three times the number of transmission lines that we currently have in the world. And and so that's tremendous amount of transmission that we're going to need. So we're going to have to think differently about how we route and how we site and how we build transmission lines. Uh, and, and, and also this notion of electrification of the vehicles. You know, there were 275 million electric cars in the United States. What are we going to do when we convert them all to electricity? Is that really what we want to do? You know, I worry a little bit about electric cars because, you know, if you look at electric cars, it looks exactly like the, the gas-powered cars. So we, I think we should be thinking a little differently. What about combining, you know, electric cars with public transportation and doing things a little bit more holistically, looking at maybe bringing electric bikes to stops along the way in, in, in the public transportation system? So we really need to think differently. We need to look closer, just like the, the near map um, uh, theme of this conference. And, and another thing is we have to, cooling and heating our homes, we're going to have to be converting all to electricity. So there are, so we need to move to heat pumps, but heat pumps also, maybe we think differently about heat pumps, maybe geothermal, all kinds of new technologies. I don't have the answer, but I know that the way we're doing things today has to be done in a much more dramatic way than we do now. Back in the 60s, President Kennedy of the United States said, we choose, to go, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And in fact, what we're referring to with, with Kennedy was the moonshot. Energy sustainability will be hard, but it will be a moonshot. So we can't just do things like we've always done. And location is the key. Near map and Esri coming together provides that, that, that sort of opening to be able to open our eyes to see things in a different way. And that's the beauty of GIS. That's the beauty of, of imagery. That's how we can see things in a different way. And there are kind of three things associated with what we need to do. We need to capture information. And, and we see things like capturing our imagery, capturing where solar, and this is where near map comes in. The beautiful imagery of where we can put things, where we can think differently, how we can think differently. And, and then second thing is understanding. How do we understand the world? What do we put it all in context? Here's, a, here's an example of a spreadsheet. Well, big deal. It's got all kinds of numbers on it. And how do we really pick out, how do we really understand that spreadsheet? Well, we can draw a red circle around these numbers and say these numbers mean a certain thing. Or we can just simply map the spreadsheet. Aha! Now that big red blob, that tells me something. That's really where I want to focus my attention. That's where I want to prioritize. That's what GIS, that's what spatial, geospatial technology allows us to do, to focus, to be able to produce information that we can see and we can take action. And we look at size, shape, and distribution, and relationships of one thing to another, and pieces and paths and, and optimal routing and, and, and patterns and predictions. That's the beauty of geospatial technology and our technologies together. 
and we want to share that information. And that's how we can do things through web services and be able to share the maps. And maps are a great way to look at the world. That's what we've done for ages, for eons, to share maps, and we do it through technology. And that's the beauty of it. And look what we did back during the, the, the height of the COVID problem. We used maps to have to show people, hey, this is what's going on here. This is what's going on there. And we also have to use a social equity lens. And by social equity, I mean you know, things like where are people of color? Where are people with disability? Where are the elderly? Where are the renters? How is this all going to impact uh, the folks in, in a dramatic sort of way? So we need to actually map social equity and take that and combine it with what we have to build. So I'm going to show this video, and this video is dramatic about the Arctic Sea the Arctic sea age decline and, and what's going to happen to the Arctic sea, the ice decline. So we're going to show this video. But if I were to say to you that the Arctic Sea is declining, or even show you statistics, you know, in a spreadsheet, would you believe me? But when you see this video, when you see the dramatic decline in the Arctic Sea, then you would fully understand it. So the way it's presented in geospatial technology helps us to do that. So geospatial technology helps us to think differently. It helps us to look closer. And I know you can do this. You can be the ones to make the change. You can make the world better. You can make this world a better place by looking closer. Thank you. Yeah.